Here we are. Hello, everyone. My name is Becky Robinson, and I'm so thrilled today to be with Heather Younger and Phil Jones. We're ready to dive into some great learning together. We're going to give you a few moments to get settled in Zoom and for everyone to get in. And as you're coming in, we hope you'll take a moment to find the chat. And when you find the chat, just make sure you're using the drop down menu to select everyone so that everyone can see your comments and let us know where you're calling in from today. We always love to know geographically where you're coming from. And also, if you happen to be attending this event as part of your professional development, we'd love to know what organization you represent. So if you go ahead and tell us in the chat, we'd love to shout you out. Um, we would love the chance to connect with you. It's great to see you, Rob, in North Carolina. Um, looks like Judith is representing Northeast W Northeast Wisconsin Technical College in Snowy Green Bay, Wisconsin, in the United States. Um, lots of state, uh, lots of states already represented. Um, looks like we've got someone from Las Vegas, Nevada, from the University of Nevada, Reno Extension. So welcome to you. Um, love to see everybody. Looks like David is here from Gainesville, Florida at UF Health Chance Hospital. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, so many people coming in. You know, I'm also curious, were you a part of the last webinar with Heather Younger? If you were, go ahead and say, I was here for the last webinar or yes, I was here or something. I don't know. Hey. Uh, welcome to Brand Apart in Atlanta. Thanks. Welcome back. <laughs> you know, this is the second of three live webinar events with Heather Younger leading up to the launch of her new book, The Art of Active Listening. And she's invited some amazing friends along for the party. And you're going to get to meet Phil Jones in just a little bit. Um, but a couple of more notes before we go any further. We are recording today's event. You will be able to watch the recording, but we're doing things a little bit differently for this event. And this video will actually be on Heather Younger. Younger's YouTube channel. So you're going to have the chance to get to know her channel. I encourage you to subscribe, check out her other content. Um, so for those of you who are used to finding this on the Weaving Influence YouTube, we're just switching things up a little bit, but you will still have access to this recording. Uh, we will also uh, be watching the chat throughout the event. Toward the end of the hour, we'll have the opportunity for you to have your questions answered by both Heather and Phil, our special guest today. So please feel free to put those in the chat. We'll get to them later on in the broadcast. As we get started, we would love to have uh, Heather to provide a little bit of background. So we have these three webinars about the art of active listening, and we want to get grounded in Heather, what do you mean when you say active listening before we dive into our conversation with Phil? Oh, but first I have to introduce you. Oh my goodness, how did I forget? <laughs> so Heather Younger is my good friend. She, uh, the Art of Active Listening is actually her third book. Her second book was The Art of Caring Leadership. She's the founder and CEO of Employee Fanatics. And what I'm impressed with about Heather is the amazing uh, journey that she's had as a keynote speaker. Uh, organizations all around the country invite her in to share her unique uh, and powerful approach to caring leadership and active listening. Um, and I love to follow her Instagram just to see all the adventures that her career takes her on. One thing you may not know about Heather is that she does have a law degree. And she's certified in emotional and social intelligence. Um, and she's also a certified diversity professional. So tons of credentials, tons of insights, tons of expertise. And we're so excited to learn with you today, Heather. I'm just thrilled to be here. Seriously jumping out of my skin right now. So let's do this. <laughs> so you want me to tell you a little bit more about active listening? I mean, the, the reason why I came up with this is that after years of diving deep into employee engagement surveys and doing employee focus groups and working with, even on the customer side of things and listening to them, I realize a lot of times those voices are, have been ignored. They really have been muted in the workplace as it relates to key stakeholders that drive the business forward. And I, someone I felt like had to be the voice for them and, and help them then learn how to have a voice and create circles and spaces for them to have a voice. And so this active listening side ha happened because I, I realized, again, the organizations weren't listening. And I think it's because they didn't quite know how to do it in a way that made people feel heard, valued, and understood at work. And that's the reason why I decided to, to just go deeper into this work. Thank you for sharing that, Heather. So we do want to get some feedback from you as we start today. We'd love to know from you uh, what benefits of active listening resonate the most or the, are the most important to you. So if you could take just a quick moment to answer our poll. Uh, do you appreciate active listening because it helps you to build trust and enhance your relationships? Uh, because it provides a deeper sense of importance and belonging? 
because it increases your overall satisfaction and happiness at work, or because it helps to decipher the difference between thinking what people want and knowing what they want. And while you're answering the poll, there's this amazing note in the chat um, only on the side um, that the hosts and panelists can see from Rich Gasson. And he said, Heather's work has been instrumental in my leadership development journey. And I am so grateful for all of her contributions to this area of my life. And what an amazing endorsement at the start of this event. Oh, mm, hugs and kisses to you, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing you know him. <laughs> yeah, he, he's, a, he's an advocate. He's a, he's a good friend. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's take a look at these poll results. We did limit to a single choice. I know it's hard to choose. And uh, let's take a look at those results together. So it looks like 48% uh, of you uh, appreciate active listening because it helps to build trust and enhance relationships. And another big percentage, 37%, uh, mentioned that it helps to decipher the difference between thinking what people want and knowing what they want. So hopefully that will inform our conversation as we move ahead today. Uh, before we go any further, I do see a question. Yes, you will be able to get access to this recording after the session so that you can share it with your friends and colleagues. And we would welcome you doing that. All right, so uh, before we move on, I wanna make sure that you know, today we do have Phil Jones, Phil M. Jones for The Art of Active Listening and Exactly What to Say, which is his best-selling book. Um, and we will have another event on March 28th. It's a very special one. I hope you'll sign up for that one too. On March 28th, we'll be with Heather Younger and Stephen M. R. Covey, and we'll be focusing on the art of active listening to build trust and inspire greatness. So I hope you'll come to that one as well. Register, uh, invite your friends and colleagues, and we would love to have you here again. Uh, before we go on, I do want to take a moment to introduce Phil M. Jones. Uh, this is my first time to meet Phil apart from our prep call. Um, but he is a master of influence and persuasion and the author of the best selling Exactly book series with over 1 million copies sold. I don't know that I've ever met anyone, maybe only a couple people who have sold a million books. Um, that is pretty impressive. And he's also the producer of the most listened to nonfiction audiobook of all time. He's a trusted advisor to some of the world's biggest brands and an entrepreneur since age 14. So welcome, Phil. I'm so grateful for you adding your thoughts to today's event. Oh, we can't uh, hear you for some reason. What's happening? There you go. Uh, I don't. Oh, there, there you, you go. go. Perfect. Look at that. We just fixed it. I have a <laughs> magic mute button on my own microphone. So I listened earlier actively <laughs> as to when I needed to be able to hit the hit the mute button. But yeah, just saying thank you, Becky, for inviting me. Heather, always a delight to show up for you. Huge advocate of your work. You do great work in the world. And it's a joy to see your new book, which I've had the chance to be able to have a peek behind the curtain on. And I think even write an endorsement or two for to um, know that that is coming real soon. So I'm excited for that. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Thanks for being here. So Phil, as a successful sales international speaker and author and consultant who sold millions of copies of your own book, what would you say will be the biggest challenges in 2023 for organizations that are looking to scale, successfully land new customers, and create more customer loyalty? Hmm. Biggest challenges. I mean, this is a big ask, right? They're looking to scale. They're looking to increase customer loyalty. They're looking to largely achieve more, more, and more. I think if I'm to try and summarize a concise answer in my viewpoint on that is we're coming out of a chapter where growth scale customer loyalty came from the ability to move fast, have intelligent systems, put themselves into a situation where what they could do is react quickly to the speed of a market. It's been very much like he who he or she who moves fastest, quickest, and with the most purpose can be able to get it done. What it's resulted, though, is a culture of organizations who don't understand at the level that they could need to understand to be able to take all the people that might maybe could possibly perhaps look to be able to move towards their direction of doing business with them. So if they're looking to scale, they're looking to retain, what they need to be able to do is to understand. If they need to understand, what they have to be able to do is to ask better questions. And by asking better questions, they can learn more insightful, empathetic information. And having that empathetic information, what they can do is hit one of the most important buttons that lives in the inside the mind of every consumer, whether that's an employee, customer, potential customer, prospect, client, which is the show me that you know me button. If they can hit the show me that you know me button up here, then guess what? They'll be able to scale more effectively. 
The challenge in all of this scenario is that the skill set of being able to ask strategically curious questions and the skill set of being able to amplify active listening has been fast forgotten because of the pace of the last decade that we've just gone through in organizations. So I couldn't think of a more relevant time to actually be able to raise people's conscious competence towards the fact that we're not as good as we should be at understanding what's really going on inside the hearts and minds of the people we're looking to influence. And influence today is about truly understanding and doing things for people, not at people, doing things with people and alongside people as opposed to in front of them. So I'm quite excited about the, the future, as I see it, of business growth is going to be more human than it has been over the last decade. And it's the businesses that get that quickest, train their people quickest on being able to question with more intelligence, listen with more purpose, and then act on what they find are the ones that are going to win. Mm -hmm. Beautifully, beautifully stated. Thanks, Phil. I, I oh. love it. Well, here's when he says that, I, he says it so naturally, which is why in, in a little bit we'll demonstrate how both of our works of works that we do and the, the focus that we have really do um, overlap and connect so much. Uh, we just say it differently. Uh, but this idea of understanding is critical, I think, when we're coming into these next uh, several years and, and just beyond, to be honest, if we aren't understanding, truly understanding, uh, then what we're doing is we're solving for the wrong thing. Um, and we aren't going to ever get to the outcomes we're looking for. And we see that all the time, Heather, right? You see people delivering brilliant advice towards the entirely wrong problem, <laughs> right? It, it happens on repeat everywhere. <laughs> and we bump into this. We're often all guilty of doing this in our own personal lives. Yeah. The days of being able to show up to a conversation and tell somebody you have their answer, those days are long in the past is we should be able to show up to conversations not knowing whether we can help. Yep. We should be able to show up to conversations caring about what we believe is possible for the other person, but without having the certainty that we are the answer. Yep. That's a messy space to live, but that messiness is where confidence and clarity comes from. And there aren't too many people that are both capable, competent, or confident to operate in that ugly place of uncertainty mm -hmm. and the superpowers that are required to live in that space are largely active listening. Mm -hmm. So very true. Certainly so. So I'm thinking about Heather, how you and Phil both speak to audiences that are filled with leaders who have a big impact on company culture and team performance. And I'm curious about what role you think active listening plays in truly understanding the needs of employees, prospects, and customers. I think kind of jumping off what Phil was saying, really our days are filled primarily with assumptions. We make a lot of assumptions. We are listening primarily to respond and to show that we're smartest. Uh, we are not taking the time to, to set assumptions aside, our biases aside, and to dig deeper into what's needed from the person in front of us by doing what Phil was talking about, which is asking questions that might come from a place, we might, we might not like the answer, but we have to get the answer, we have to get to the truth in order to solve for the thing that we need to solve for to get to the outcome we're looking for. And I think the problem is that we want the outcomes, but we're not really doing the hard work, which is the leaning in, which is to seek from a place of giving, serving the other first and getting second. So I say this because I work in the business world and I, I have to get stuff in order to like be successful and for the business to grow. Uh, but the focus is if we aren't there to serve the other by our listening, really seeking to go deeper, to really get to their truth, not our truth. Uh, we aren't ever going to uncover it for whether it's the customer, the employee, it doesn't matter really which stakeholder it is at work. This is the reason why I wrote this, this book and purposely without the word leader or employee in the title, because I really want it to be more inclusive, to include everyone at work and whoever they're listening to. And, and hopefully they're listening very actively. I agree entirely with what Heather's saying here is that the, the importance of being able to, to listen actively is a superpower. And by superpower, I mean exactly what I'm saying there. I mean that it is a superpower that doesn't exist in the many because of this inability that many of us have to be in time with the music. And the reason we're not in time with the music is because we're either editing what we just said or what somebody else just said, 
or we're trying to pre-plan for the thing that we're going to say next or what we think somebody else might say next. So you're never in the moment. You're always off beat. You're always off path. So speaking to audiences all around the world, that if they are truly to understand the needs of their employees, prospects, and customers, they have to understand how to do that. This is why when I got the chance to be able to read Heather's book, and I'm going to jump to something unprompted here as well, is I was rereading the manuscript of the book earlier today. And you know I have it like here in front of me. So I know it's a bit of a tease for those that are finding out about the book. But it's like there's a model that lives in this book that, that yes, you need to read the book to understand it properly. But it's a five-step model that really overlays with a ton of the work that we do with exactly what to say, where to Heather's methodology is the cycle of listening is to firstly recognize the untold, then seek to understand, then decode, then act, then close the loop, right? Like it's a five-step dance card that I think everybody on this call can agree with. And some of you are thinking, like, I get that, right? I have to recognize the unsaid. I have to seek to understand. I have to decode. I have to act. I have to close the loop. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, but how? Yeah, but how? Yeah, but how? In my world with exactly what to say, we teach a framework. The funnily, like I just stumbled across today, like lays straight over the top of Heather's framework here. See, in our world, we say that in order to have influence in any conversation, you need to start from a position of curiosity, to then reach a position of empathy and then have the courage to make big, bold asks. Those three things in that precise order. If we're looking to be able to understand why that's so important is we start a position from a position of curiosity. Why? Because we're looking to recognize the unsold and we're looking to seek to understand. How many times have you shown up in a conversation where somebody is so sure of themselves that the more certain they are in themselves, the more certain they are in their point of view, the less certain you become in them? We think that experts need to have all the answers. Uh -uh. Experts today, more than ever, need to be curious with their questions, strategically curious with their questions, to understand something remarkably important. Context. You have content you want to insert to conversations as leaders, as sales professionals, as entrepreneurs. But if you insert content before you understand context, all you did is add noise to a conversation that was already difficult to listen to. If you'd like to be able to listen with more intent, firstly, understand somebody else's context. You do that by being strategically curious, which means you then truly do understand and you do recognize the unsold. When you stay curious for long enough, you reach yourself at this position of empathy. Empathy is like a buzzword, right? People throw it around in corporate world like it's confetti at the wedding, thinking people understand they know what the word means. Best definition I've heard for empathy comes from a speaker friend of mine, an author friend of mine, one that I have, or I don't know if you know as well, is, is a guy by the name of John Acuff. Mm -hmm. And John Acuff describes empathy as to care about what the people you care about care about. To care about what the people you care about care about, you have to have actively listened which means that before you're going to act in any way, shape or form, before you're going to close a loop in any way, shape or form, you have to be able to truly understand what is going on. You have to hit that show me that you know me button. You have to be relatable. See, the goal of active listening isn't so that you can actively listen. It's so that you can create change. It's because there is something you see for the world that could be better, but you might be wrong in what you believe is true for being better. But by actively listening, by being strategically curious with your questions, by being empathetic to be side by side with them versus it, guess what? You're now not trying to be able to win the argument, which I think sometimes is what we find ourselves looking to do. If an argument has a winner and a loser and you are the winner, then that means the other person feels like a loser. I hate that. The other person feels like a loser. We're in trouble, right? But when you're truly empathetic, which is what the art of active listening allows you to do, you then have the courage to be able to make big, bold asks that do create change, that are big actions, that do close the loop, that do allow this whole thing to be able to cycle round, round, and round, and round again. So that's what I love about even being invited to be in this discussion today, is we've never had a tool in our world other than saying you should actively listen to explain to people how. And in this crazy manuscript that I had the gift of being able to read, <laughs> the answer to yeah, but how is mapped out that if anybody like gives a damn about wanting to listen at a level 
in order to be able to create change, then the art of like active listening gets you there. But tools in our world about how do you be more strategically curious to ask more meaningful questions? How do you preface big, bold ask to turn rude and obnoxious into soft and fluffy? How do you create moments that are side by side that create two winners as opposed to a winner and a loser are all more effective when somebody can actively listen. So I'm pumped for your book to show up in the world. I'm pumped to recommend and refer it to others. Sorry for my little segue to be able to share that framework in. Because I we're talking it. about trust, right? Like that's what we're talking about doing is how are you trusted by your people, trusted by your customers, trusted by your prospects? Mm-hmm. Yep. And actually the reason, one of the reasons I want to bring you here, you know, had you in here as a guest is I, I like to turn things on its head because people are like, well, Heather talks about like caring leadership and like culture and like listening. And, and then Phil's <laughs> over here talking about like, persuasion and, and I, I, you'd be surprised number one there's two things we'd be very surprised as you can see now how much overlap there is how both of the the both the frameworks really uh complement each other there's there's we're not telling there's no differences in that it's just how we say it and at the same time most people don't know this about me i don't really share it about but probably 65 percent of my work background is in sales and customer experience and I'm, most people know me as the workplace culture employee engagement employee whisper person uh and that's that was chosen by me because I wanted to go in that direction. But as I got into this more deeply, I realized that I was limiting the impact of the message that I needed to know that the people needed to know at work that, that this was accessible to everyone, despite their title and position. And I wanted people in sales to say, well, how do I do this with my prospects? And I wanted people in customer service, customer care to say, how do I do this with them? And how do I do this with folks that are, you know, investor relations? And how do I, so I want people to be considering this, everybody at work, everybody on this, on this webinar, to be thinking about how, what role you play in learning to, to use this framework in a, um, you know, more consistent basis. This is not about perfection, though. So I always say, like, when I teach this stuff, this is not about you slapping yourself around for what you didn't do well this morning or last night. It's thinking through what you can do better just a little bit every day and how you can incorporate, for example, decoding, which really is this idea of pausing to reflect after we receive feedback and to Mm -hmm. consider what we're going to do next. Can our action be strategic? So thank you. What I love about much of your methodology around active listening, Heather, is it's, it's not condescending. And I mean that as a, as a significant compliment. Much of what is taught about active listening is things like mirroring and repeating and 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 acknowledging that you heard somebody by, you know, echoing it back to them, etc. And I'm not saying these skills aren't useful, but what they are is like grade school, elementary school versions of active listening. What you've done is bring a level of emotional intelligence plus strategic practical intent that says, well, you know, there are levels above this that isn't something you do to somebody. It's something you do for somebody. Mm, absolutely. And, and I think as leaders today, there is great responsibility in how you show up to the conversations that matter is how you make yourself open to hear what other people are saying and not just hear what they're saying is hear the undercurrent in the unsaid is to create space for more to be able to show up than what actually left their mouth is to get to the heart of the heart of the heart of whatever is in the other person's mindset. When we get this stuff right, productivity goes through the roof. Retention goes through the roof relationships and efficacy of those relationships goes through the roof and all the stuff that isn't un- that remains unsaid in active listening remains unsaid in culture remains unsaid in sales results yet the results don't lie people stay people are happier in the workplace sales numbers go up and people are like i don't know how that happened and you're like well it's just our culture and what you really have articulated is you can create a culture like that by growing people's awareness as to how they can actively listen at a level they've never even understood was possible in the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Look, look at that. Gosh, I should put him on like a reel. Uh, <laughs> like a, a, just a return. Anybody else here agree with that? Just, Oh, Phil's like Heather's big advocate. Like I did massive cheerleader. cheerleader. I love that. <laughs> For sure. Well, Thank I want to go that. back Heather to something that you said and Phil, get your input on this. I'm curious if there's a scenario you can think of when slowing down to decode what someone said to you or requested from you led to greater organizational or team success? Like what are the results that we can expect if we learn how to do this effectively? Is 
I'll dive on this first because the number of scenarios are plentiful, if I'm honest. It's it's all the time. In one of the principles that we teach is if you slow the process down, you can speed the outcome up. A micro example that comes out of the body of work with exactly what to say is, is efficacy of referrals and introductions into other people that could go on to be able to buy products and services. A mistake that almost everybody makes when they're looking to be able to create introductions for potential new customers is they swap an opportunity to garner a referral for a lead. What do I mean by that is instead of me having a meaningful conversation with Heather about a past client that she did business with that she thinks would be a good fit for my work, instead of accepting a lazy email introduction or her giving me the name and number of an event manager or another event, slowing that conversation down, slowing that process down, finding out about the why behind the what, learning about Heather's experience as to what really happened at that event, understanding the multiple stakeholders that would exist in the decision-making process at that other organization, maybe looking for some mutual acquaintances or some shared connections that would allow me to amplify trust before showing up, me spending somewhere as much as like a whole nother seven to 10 minutes, not much more than that, of strategically asking questions of Heather plus actively listening to her answers would mean that when I find myself in a conversation with that potential new client for me, my chances of success are significantly higher and the speed of decision that would be made by that person would happen insanely quicker because of the fact that I'd hit the show me that you know me button. Because of all the stories that I collected from Heather's first-hand experience and now my second-hand experience that allows me to show up to that conversation knowing that person insanely better and to show up far better prepared. We teach our clients to do this on repeat, but in terms of the number of times I've seen that speed up a decision is slowing down to garner a little more information before running into opportunity. I couldn't count the number <laughs> of times. That's how often it shows up. It's everywhere, but people are wasting opportunity everywhere because they're too fast. They're yes, too quick. so true. And that's that decoding this right here, this exact point you're talking about is I always say that when we when we rush to action after receiving feedback, a request, a complaint, whatever that is, we then do a disservice to both ourself and the other, because as Phil's alluding to, we do not get to the crux of the matter. We are not finding the real pain. We are not finding what potential solutions, we are not finding the real connection points. So if we slow down, do research, evaluate, pause, reflect, include more people in our process of thinking and processing. Now, when we go take the action, it's more pointed, it's more focused. It meets the need of the person that we're speaking to. So if we're thinking about sales, we're thinking about customer experience, it really doesn't matter which audience we're talking about. This works no without matter what. friction as well, right, Heather? That's the thing yeah. is without friction. In the yeah. medical industry, they say that prescription before diagnosis is malpractice. <laughs> Yet as leaders in our organization, you can probably count a plentiful number of scenarios in the last 7, 10, 14 days that you have prescribed before you've diagnosed the action that is required. It's ever present in every organization that I walk into. And could you imagine walking into a doctor's surgery and that you, you sit yourself down and the doctor said, I'm pleased you showed up today. Pharmaceutical rep told me about these new two pills. You should take these once a day and you'll be able to do things you can only dream of. You'd probably have some <laughs> resistance towards that advice. By alternative, if the doctor slows down, ask some meaningful questions of you, understands your symptoms, maybe runs a test or two, and then advises you to take the exact same two pills, what do you now do? You now do as you are told without friction. That is the combination of strategic questioning and active listening that you've all seen show up. And more often than not, if you find yourself in a situation where you don't trust the advice of other people, it's because you don't believe they understand your context and you don't believe they've truly listened to you first. That's why you lack trust in their advice. Yes. And Thomas Reynolds in the chat, I saw that you were saying like right and root cause. And it's so true. The, the only way we can solve or get an outcome we want or solve for a situation is to find out the pinpoint. We have to pinpoint that root cause. We got to find out what it is. What's their pain? What's their why? What do they need from us? We cannot, if we make assumption, we're going to probably fail all day. We may like be successful 20% of the time. So when anything that we're trying to get done at work, 
if we aren't pausing enough to 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 recognize what's not being said to to lean in to seek for the circus of for the for the focus of serving the other first getting what we want in the end but serving them first pausing to reflect on the next action with a group acting upon that in strategic ways not everything requires action sometimes people want us to hear them and that's all they want that is the action they're requesting from us they right. want nothing the action else is no action right the action exactly. is in action yeah because sometimes we act and it's like, oops, we just stepped all over ourselves. We should not have acted. And they didn't even want us to. And then that closing loop is telling It happens. Occasions, right? Yeah. Is, oh, is, gosh, yeah. <laughs> right? Is, is right there. Active listening meant active listening and then taking no action at the end of it. And there's me trying to fix something that somebody wanted me just to listen to. Right? It shows up everywhere. So it absolutely does. I try to limit this book to work because I'm like, listen, I am not a relationship expert when it comes to my spouse <laughs> or oh, my I'm children. Just I'm just saying my own flaws at this point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it seems like we are starting to identify what some of the stumbling blocks are or the barriers are to listening well at work. And we do want to engage our attendees with a fun uh, opportunity to share their perspective. So I'm about to invite all of you, and you'll see this in Zoom, to participate in a mentee poll where you can type in your responses and we'll be able to see them in real time as we continue to discuss with Phil and Heather what these barriers are to listening at work. So I'm inviting all of you at this point uh, to weigh in. And then I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that you can see those answers popping in in real time uh, to this question, what is the biggest barrier to listening well at work? Hopefully, you'll be able to figure that out. Um, I, I believe that you have to have uh, Zoom maximized or not maximized. I can't remember. Hopefully you'll be able to figure this out. Uh, but at, as folks are beginning to put in their answers, Heather and Phil, what are some barriers that you see? I think it, uh, part of it is what Phil talked about earlier, which is, um, you know, us when waiting to respond, like we want to be right. I mean, we, you know, when we think about listening, we it's innate in us to want people to hear us, for people to want to hear our voices. It starts when we're babies in the crib and parents respond or when they don't respond and we, we respond then accordingly with happiness or with uh, cantankerousness where we're throwing things out of the crib because we're not happy because no one heard us. So all of us are, it's innate in us. We want to be heard. So the biggest thing is that while we want others to be heard, we want to be heard just as much. So our biggest barrier in my mind is remove, is, is replacing, it's seeking to serve others before us. It's replacing the need to truly hear and, and, and get to the bottom of what the other person says before us being right, before our voice is being heard. So it's almost counterintuitive. This listening thing is a little bit counterintuitive because it is innate. Our voices are our voices. It's a significant part of what makes us us. We want to be heard. So we have to fight against that. We have to fight against that often to say, I want to be heard. I know my, my side is an intelligent side to be heard, but the other person has value in and of themselves. If they had, they deserve my time and attention. They deserve my undivided attention to be, to hear them really truly, not for what I assume they want to say, not what I think is the best thing for them to say, but for what it is they want to say. So it really is that difference between us assuming what they want and us really knowing what it is they want. I think that's the biggest barrier. I think I'll try and add to this and I'm reading all these examples that are coming in and and to me, it falls into one of three areas. The, the first area is this area of, of almost ignorance is the, the barrier is actually we don't want to know. We're fearful of what we might find out, that there is some way that it's safer to just make assumptions and to, to, to make decisions based on the unknown and the unsaid and the unheard, because that's a safer place to operate. If I don't know what's really true, then I just have to act and it's easier to act on opinion than it is to act on knowledge. So ignorance could be one. Now that's none of you folks that are here on this call, because if you were that kind of person, you wouldn't decide to shine up, show up to a webinar. So it must be you know one of the other two reasons, which is either a timing issue the barrier to listening effectively at work is that the, the right time or window or structure is not created in order to have a culture of listening. There isn't the right meeting structure. There isn't the right you know, windows of opportunities. There isn't the right moments for you to be able to show up to create a listening moment. So life remains too busy and that the perfect moment doesn't appear. And if it isn't a timing issue, the third thing is it's, it, it's a skill. 
there's a skill that is missing that you haven't been trained on that you haven't yet worked to be able to master or practice or get to a point of high levels of competence that is standing in your way of being able to listen more effectively you don't know how to start the conversation you don't know how to ask for more you'll become fearful of being able to get into something you don't know how to move on from or to get out of so that you don't get into that situation of listening what i love about heather's work is is it intelligently deals with the last two of those things very very well it, it it dives into the how do you create more space more timing to be more efficient about how you can listen and then it gives practical application practical application practical application on how you can start to evolve your skills as a professional listener which is something that nobody has ever written in a resume right like hey i'm a professional listener I think what Heather is doing is is almost creating a new class of competence as to something that leaders should look for in leaders and something that people should look for in their teammates is people's ability to truly actively listen. And Heather's definition of that work is, is something that can allow us to be able to knock down some of these barriers. So be brave enough to not be one of the people that lets ignorance stand in the way of you finding out what's really not being said. Do the work to be able to create space so that the times can exist that you can truly listen. And then also relish rookie mode of the fact that you might not be as good at this as you could be and give yourself the ability to learn some new skills. It's okay that you're pretty good at this. We can change the stakes and say, well, what would it look like if you were world class at this? And, and give yourself the the ability of being able to level up your own performance before you invite other people to level up theirs. Mm. Love it. Love it. This is such great stuff. All of the things that you all put in there. Um, most, uh, many of the things are in the book, but there's some other things that were insightful to me. So I'm looking for, what I'm looking forward to doing is diving more into the mentee results, diving more into the chat to really see what it is that you kind of parse out what you are thinking, uh, those who are on the webinar, uh, super helpful for me. So thanks for that feedback. It's amazing to see the level of engagement today. This is a topic that seems to be resonating well. And I am I know, Phil, that you uh, have some ideas about uh, ways that we can spread this message further into the world. Oh, yeah, you know it. I mean, is the reason that people are so inspired to participate in this conversation why the engagement is so much is because there is general understanding that we're not as good as we could be at this in our relationships in our work lives in how we show up to our communities and and, and just give me some validation on that that i'm not speaking crazy like like just light it up in the chat am i speaking truth here just give me like a, a truth or untruth is that the reason we're engaged with this topic is because we're hyper aware of the fact that we can be better. So if you agree with me, just like, yeah, truth, like Elizabeth is like, yes, that'd be true. <laughs> right? We are here knowing that this is 100% truth. So something I'm really intrigued about doing, though, Heather, is, is you've written a book that is about the art of active listening. As somebody who has sold now 1.7 million books, there is something I've learned that sells books, which is I've read this book and you should read it too. So books are gifted and volunteered to other people because you would think it would be helpful to others. Now, I wrote a book called Exactly What to Say, amongst others. That is a very giftable book. How do you take a book like The Art of Active Listening and suggest to somebody else that um, they might want to read it? I think there there are many ways. You you already kind of alluded to it, uh, which I think is a really effective way, which is the gifting part. I remember giving a book to someone where I I they needed to read what was inside of it. It wasn't <laughs> critical. It wasn't critical necessarily to them. It was just like an eye opening new way yeah. of thinking. And I put it in a bag with a bow, and I like tied it. You know, and it looked like a gift. And so I felt like it opened up in their mind again something that's a gift is you're going to be much more likely to be utilized or or read than it would be if I'm saying you need help in this, <laughs> right? So when you gift it to them, giving them a compliment, maybe it's not the compliment fully of what the thing of the thing that they're 
that's inside the book, but maybe it's like an ancillary arm of it. So I, I've, I've really found that you do this well, or you do that well. And this book is just as amazing as I think it's really helped me take this to the, to the next level. And I think it maybe can help you as well. Um, because I think you're already good at this, this or that. So when you do that, it's not like, oh, yours just so awful, making sure that you also maybe give it to more than one person. So for example, maybe if you have, if, if you are someone with a manager title, you're on a leadership team, you can give it to everybody on the team, you can gift it to all of them. Or if you mm. are a leader of a team and you want to give it to your team, or it's on your team, you just buy a few copies for your team members if you're not a manager. I, well, I do want to say this as I continue to, to um, answer this question. It is that this book is for everyone. And as, as Phil and I say the word leader, we're we're being very inclusive and expansive with that. It is not just those of us who might have manager titles or managed one person or a whole team or an entire organization. It's meant for those on the front line. It's meant for those at the top. It's meant for those in the middle and whoever it is you are interacting with. It's the relational side of interactions at work that we're really getting to. And it doesn't matter what your title is. So I just wanna make sure I say that right here. I think there's just a lot of different ways that we can give this to people where it doesn't make it seem like they're deficient, like we're, mm -hmm. we're zeroing in on them as being like somebody who needs help. Because as Phil just said, we all need help. Like I write about this. He writes about exactly what to say. We, I speak on it. He speaks. But it, no matter what, we're still learning every day how to get better, how to ask better questions, how to be more empathetic, how to be more curious, right? How to lean in to seek to understand someone. So I think we can all get better, which I think is exciting to me because we're not in this alone. I think that's the point, Heather, there in its entirety is this isn't a skill that you master. This is a skill that you practice. It's like meditation or yoga. You don't get to a point like I'm crushing it at meditation. <laughs> like, that can't be true. And I think the same is true with listening here is that this is a conscious practice that you have to keep bringing yourself back to. So here's my encouragement to people. And I know it's something that I'm doing. Like, like I've already jumped to Amazon on my phone. I've pre-ordered a number of copies here right now. And I've done that for one main reason is, is I want to be first with this book. So what I'd like to be is when this book exists in the world is I'd like to have it in my possession to be able to give to other people so I can start the conversation with them about active listening when the book is brand new. So I can say things like, you know, I was in a conversation with the author of Heather, with Heather, I got a chance to be able to preview this book early, et cetera. And the same I'd say to people here in this webinar discussion is if we've catalyzed thought today about the fact that the consciousness around active listening needs to be higher than where it is today, you get a position of authority within the moments that you're looking to influence to be able to build off this story. You get the ability to be able to make sure that you pre-order so that you're one of the first to get books in hand and then put yourself in a situation when the book comes in hand is to say, hey, I was in a conversation with Heather and Phil and I really got some thoughts that were helpful to me. And I think we should run a practice together about how collectively we can grow our competence and consciousness about our ability to listen. If you are first, you are then in the champion inside your workplace of allowing people to believe that listening is a superpower and are actually the individual that is responsible for catalyzing a culture of listening within your community. So that's what I'd be doing right now is I'd make sure that what doesn't happen is I don't wait for the book to show up to then have somebody else tell me about the book to be like, yeah, I know. I, like, I <laughs> know about it. Like be first and then be the kind of person that creates practice around how to listen more effectively. And I think that's how you can bring people with you on the journey as opposed to, listen, you never listen to me. <laughs> Just catch that, right? People have said, listen, you never listen to me. And in that scenario, they might be part of their own problem, but that's a story for another day. <laughs> well, as we're coming to the end of our conversation, before we start to take some questions from our attendees, uh, I think it's always powerful to hear about some times that you have felt well listened to. So I'm curious, both Phil and Heather, I don't know which of you wants to go first, maybe Phil this time first, or maybe Heather this time <laughs> first, <laughs> whoever speaks first. Uh, what was one time in your life when someone really listened to you and made you feel heard? I have a good, good one on this. There's, I have a, um, I had a, somebody who I to this day consider like my best manager ever. And I remember I was frustrated in a role. I was leading customer experience for an organization. And I was frustrated because I felt like I wasn't given kind of the the open field to really go run and make what the vision was happen. And he sensed it. 
uh, he just sensed the frustration. And one day he came down to my office, knocked on the outside, knocked on my door frame. And, and he came in with this big old smile on, my face, on his face. I'm like, what is happening? I'm like, what am I, what did I do wrong? <laughs> That's kind of what happens often. Your manager just stops into your office. You're like, what's happening? And he said, Heather, if, you know, how are you doing? And he said, you know, I just want you to know like, you're doing amazing work. And I know we're frustrating you because we are holding you back maybe from doing what you want to do, but just keep your chin up, keep going forward. I hired you to do this work. And I just want you to know that you're doing an amazing job. And what he did is he saw me. So like listening is also like seeing. Remember we talked about recognizing the unsaid. He saw my frustration. He sensed some changes in me and he came down and met me in the moment. And I mean, I, I mean I'm telling you to this day, be, mostly because of the interaction, but because of how he showed up in very similar ways after that, I would do anything for that man to today. It, it, it created in me a sense of loyalty and endearment. And um, that's, that's an example I have when I felt heard. Hmm. Hmm. That's a great story. It's fantastic. And I'm here listening to your response, thinking about also scenarios in my life that I can answer that to. And, and being open and candid in today's discussion, I can't think of that many, which is a concern all by itself. What I will say, though, is there is a community of people that I'm very privileged to be a part of that is called Epic. It's a um, mastermind group that I meet with uh, once a year. We have four or five days together up in Toronto. It is um, no more than 100 heart-centered entrepreneurs, shared value-based uh, professional thought leaders. And, and, and all of the occasions that I can relate to where I feel like somebody has truly listened Almost all of them happened at one of those events. Mm. So what does that teach me, even in this moment here right now, is to actively put yourself into environments with people who hold the skill set of being able to actively listen. It isn't a common skill set. It isn't something that is regularly understood. And also the my realization of of, of even understanding how much I struggle to answer that question was to think how can I do a better job of being the answer to that question when somebody else is asked it in the future for them that's almost the mantra that I take from even you asking that question today Becky is is seeing how infrequently it happens how can I be somebody else's answer to that question in the future what do I need to do to make sure that the fewer people in the world struggle to answer that question Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yes. powerful, Phil. Like, it's also painful to think, you know, if I ask you that question and you don't have a ready answer, then that means many of us are hungry to be heard and listened mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. And listening is a gift then. Um, all right. So I see a lot of questions that are coming in the chat and I want to uh, go to a few that came in earlier in the hour. Uh, Sonia asked, why do leaders not want to listen? <laughs> I think often, I mean, I would say one of the biggest things is, uh, well, there's besides like the lacking the skill to do it, I think it's not wanting to deal with what we find. Many mm -hmm. of us don't want to get to the truth. It's too painful. It's too hard. It requires us to dig deep. It requires us to set ourselves aside for the sake of the other. That's a big reason why people don't want to be actually like listening. Like, I like it. It's cool. Mm, maybe I should do it. But then in the end, like if I, if they tell me the truth, what am I going to do about it? Am I prepared to do anything about it? That's what I think. Hmm. Yep. I think it happens everywhere. And, and you know, this is why people don't talk to their customers to listen to about what they really think, because now they might have to change their plan and they don't want to change their plan. Like listening is risky because it is almost certainly going to provide evidence that doesn't currently exist. And that evidence is going to need to be acted upon. Otherwise, you're irresponsible in your role. Um, so uh, people don't want to listen because they might be scared by what they found out. And that's the headline for it. Um, but because they're not truly committed to being for people. And I, and I, that's the risk is that too many people are for themselves as opposed to for an outcome or for others. And there are a lot of leaders in big companies today that I bump into that are in serious leadership positions that are still only in it for themselves and not realizing that, that all roles within leadership, whether you're leading your family or you're leading a giant corporation are a duty towards others with yourself somewhere further down that pecking order is that you get to win when others win and your duty of care is towards 
organizing the noise, which means you have to listen. Thank you. Uh, so Jen asked this question early on also when, uh, Phil, when you were sharing the cycle of listening from Heather's book, um, she was wondering what happens if you get stuck on a step? And then I I remember also seeing a question about like, how do you move on if you're trying to get someone to listen and they're not? Um, Jen, if you're still here um, and want to clarify your questions, I want to make sure that we can answer and I want to acknowledge that you had those. Uh, so so what happens if, if you get stuck in the cycle? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the key is uh, that whole idea of the outcome or forcing the outcome of, or like you can't force others to listen. So like, that's the other thing is that this work is an inward job uh, so that you can influence others' ability to listen by you also emulating that uh, and asking the good questions so that it it requires them to, uh, like more focus into what's happening in the conversation. Questions help with that. Questions help others zero in on your conversation instead of being, them being diverted by other places. So I just say first is that we need to focus on us first. Don't don't worry too much on trying to control or change some other people. Let's change us first, uh, which is a harder job to do. And by doing that, we influence others. Um, the stuck thing is an interesting concept. I really never thought about that. I mean, I guess what you, I guess I can see that happening is if you're like, I got stuff on this. do you have it? Go ahead. Yeah, Go. I got stuff on this is um, firstly, is if you find yourself not getting somebody to, to listen, you have to resist moving to tell mode. And by tell mode, that could be as simple as using the words like, tell me. Tell me what you were thinking. Tell me what's really going on. Tell me what you need me to be able to do. Anytime you're in tell mode, whether physically or by labeling the words ahead of time with tell, is you're going to create more resistance. The other person is going to shut down. So even though your desire is to get them to listen, you are less likely to get them to listen or for you to be able to listen to them all the time you move to tell mode because barriers go up, defense changes. Is if you're looking to create a culture of listening, is understand there's one thing that everybody loves to give, which is they all like to help. So think about phrasing language that anytime you're looking to have somebody expand upon an answer, don't say, tell me more, tell me more, tell me more, or any version of tell. Shift your language towards something like, help me understand. So, um, like, help me um, understand what some of the things are that you you've been thinking that have got us to this point you know a curiosity fueled question starting with the words help and help me understand is pulley it's not pushy it creates an opening for somebody to breathe into it says this is safer people think that confidence in leadership presents itself in a way of almost being gregarious in the alpha male version of confidence when we're talking about a culture of listening Strength in leadership is about creating a safe space. You create a safe space by creating a gray space. You create a gray space because it's a play space. That play space is the safe space. You do that by being strategically curious, by doing things like saying, look, um, oh, help me, um, help me, um, help me like understand what you think we should do. And you see how the hesitancy in the delivery of a question, the nervousness around the delivery of the question takes the sting out of it, creates a space that you can listen and that you can expand more. Now, if you then get yourself stuck, don't force it. What you have to then look to be able to do is to realize that this might be the right conversation. This might be the wrong time to have the right conversation. So you jump to a technique called labeling. The first thing that you might do is you might label the situation and say, this is clearly a more important conversation than we have the time, space or energy to deal with right now. You label it for what it is. And then what you do is you get permission to revisit and you get permission to revisit with words like when would be a good time. When would be a good time for us to be able to sit and talk about this properly without all of these distractions? When would be a good time for us to be able to explore this further so I can really understand what's going on? When would be a good time for you to share what really happened with me where you feel like you can unpack it without this level of emotion? 
when would be a good time? And then what you've done is you've rescheduled the conversation with purpose to a future date that allows both people to properly prepare ahead of time to then show up to a conversation where people are prepared to be open and listen. So what have we got there? A few little things is, is be more curious with the way you ask questions. Swap tells to helps. Never use tell me, rephrase it with help me understand. We've also got that if things are going off the rails, label it as this is going off the rails, kindly and politely with permission, and then ask a when would be a good time question to show that this is still important to be able to revisit, but you've took the emotional responsibility that now is not the time nor the place. And guess what? You'll make progress and you can move people at their pace as opposed to try and drag them at yours and you can achieve a quicker outcome. Mm -hmm. So I hope that helps. Thank you so much. Uh, so we are coming to the end of our hour. We are going to have Heather wrap us up with some closing thoughts in just a moment. But before we do that, I do want to make sure that you know how to be involved in the launch of this important book, How to Be First, as Phil spoke about. So we've got some QR codes up on the screen. We also have some links in the chat where you can pre-order your copy of The Art of Active Listening on Amazon. You can also bulk order for your organization on Porchlight, and you can use one of those QR our codes to do that. But I also want to let you know about a special opportunity that you could join Heather's VIP book launch team and get some exclusive perks and content and be more engaged in supporting this wor work in a bigger way in the world. Another QR code for that if you like, or again, like I said, we're going to put those links into the chat for you. I also want to own that there are a lot of questions that did come in that we didn't have time to get to today. And I know that Heather is committed to creating content that is connected to what you're really wanting to know. So we're going to share those questions with her and she may be addressing them in a social media post or article or podcast episode coming soon. And I know that she'll love to stay in touch with you to make sure that you're getting the insights that you like. So Heather, uh, how do you want to wrap up with us today? And then I think when you're done wrapping up, we do want to uh, kick back to folks with another mentee to get their key takeaways from today. Um, I would say that the, the, the kind of at a very basic level, um, our presence really is the biggest present or the gift that we give other people that we are 100% in control of this. And we can just have, we can match the skill by practicing and practicing, but never being perfect. As uh, Phil talked about, it is a journey. Uh, you're not on it alone. We're all here trying to get better. Uh, but just understand that, that, that everybody around you, around you really wants their voices to be heard. And you do too. And prioritizing theirs over yours is going to get you more than what you ever thought you'd get. So the outcomes that you're seeking, uh, whether your personal or professional life, uh, you're going to get that if you lean into this idea of listening to serve. 